Engage. Welcome back aboard the Starship Texas for the 141st installment of the Text Trek podcast, the home for Star Trek fandom from deep in the heart of Texas, where we talk deep about Star Trek. And uh, we, we talk have... deep about Star Trek. We talk deep about Deep Space Nine. We, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing tonight. Uh, we have a uh, season three discussion, or part part one of two. Well, kind of part one of three. More about that in a second. But we're talking about like the first half of DS9 season three. We've yeah. discussed seasons one and two, and now we're moving into season three. We're going to marathon through all the those 13 episodes in like a kind of quick format and uh, do our highlight reel discussion of what's cool, what's weird, and what's interesting about them. And just to uh, remind everyone, Dave, you are watching these for the first time. You've uh yes. never never gone this deep into deep space nine until now yeah no that's totally true and, and and like i know so little about it most of what i know is what gets mentioned on other shows and there's um some stuff that, like even that stuff i often have forgotten because i don't have anything to kind of ground it uh with having watched it or anything like that so even when we get to the first episode i will have something where it was a surprise to me even though it's probably common fandom knowledge but something happened that was a big surprise to me. <laughs> well, let's just start at the top of the season with the two-part opener, The Search, parts one and two. I'm going to read the synopses I pulled off of Memory Alpha, and then we'll just kind of elaborate on those and then share notes. But mm -hmm. part one, the synopsis is, Cisco takes an untested Starfleet warship into the Gamma Quadrant in an attempt to find the founders of the Dominion. So this is basically picking up where Season 2 ended with the introduction of the Jim Hadar and the establishment of, of the Dominion as this big threat. And now Cisco is going into the Gamma Quadrant to uh, learn more about that. And we get the introduction of the Defiant. So we'll have a lot to say on that in just a moment. Then the synopsis for Part 2 is, on his homeworld... Odo learns about his people. While back on the station, Sisko discovers that the price the Federation is willing to pay for peace with the Dominion may be too high. The Founders learn that the only way they are going to take over the Alpha Quadrant is through war. Uh, basically, we meet Odo's people as well, and meet the Founders of the Dominion, because, big reveal, they are one and the same. His people are the Dominion Founders, and, yeah, it looks like there is definitely a major potential conflict with the Federation and the Dominion uh, on the rise uh, coming in, in the future. So, uh, Dave, what did you think about seeing this stuff for the first time? Uh, so I thought that this is uh, one of the coolest first episodes of a season that they've had. Um, uh, way, uh, way high suspense, loved seeing the Defiant. Then I guess, you know, very, just very broadly, part two uh, while it had lots of bits and pieces I liked, it intrigued me, and uh, uh, I loved uh, watching Cisco yell at Necheyev uh, <laughs> and get riled up. Um, was was a little disappointing for part partially because of its virtual reality esque qualities, which we can talk about a little bit more when we get to it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I had my my two biggest things that I kind of didn't know about the show or didn't really get. One was that the Defiant was as big as it was, like that it was actually like a, though smaller than other starships, pretty still a starship. <laughs> I thought it was like a like it's just a kind of a slightly overblown runabout with a bridge and not much else. And uh, so I was excited to see that. Oh no, this is a cramped but big ship uh, that is just like this gunship that uh, 
can uh, deliver the punishment when it needs to. <laughs> and it has a cloaking device and all this other cool stuff. I, I sort of wanted to actually even see more of a tour of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and we do see more of the Defiant interior later in the season. Like, we'll eventually see, like, engineering, where the warp core is, and, uh, you know, s s s but, yeah, in this episode, we get, like, the bridge, and, then, like, uh, Cisco says what the, its the basic bunk. cool features are, and I don't know if I necessarily wanted a Star Trek The Motion Picture five-minute flyby, <laughs> but I would not have minded a Martin Scorsese single-camera walkthrough, or, um, a single shot walkthrough, I guess I should say, um, or or something that at least approximated that would have been kind of cool. Um, but you know, I understand they that was not something they could easily do in those days. Um, nowadays, I wouldn't want it. What well, is that cool introduction right at the beginning of of the episode with with the cloaking device, where it's like, "Whoa, this is a Starfleet ship that cloaks!" Like that mm -hmm. is uh, that's new and different. So it's it's pretty cool right off the bat. Yeah, Cisco thought he'd play a little prank while they were all terrified that war was coming by suddenly decloaking <laughs> right next to him. <laughs> yeah, Funny, right, Cisco. right when they're, they're running simulations on, uh, oh, like the <laughs> the Dominion would totally like kick our ass and like t conquer the station instantly, and then all of a sudden, like all of a sudden, the ship appears. He said he said yeah. he needed to test it though. He wanted to make sure it worked. No, no, it's a. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a cool scene. I liked it, and I will always take drama over, I guess, realism that's a little bit kind of sluggish. The um, in fact, that sort of sense of palpable threat and danger from the Dominion, which I did not expect to kind of buy into. I guess I'd heard about him years ago, and I was like. You know, just thinking about how Star Trek is like, oh, the Romulans are the big bad. Oh, no, the Borg are the big bad. You know, and then, they, you know, they would kind of keep upping the ante. And, um, you know, I was like, I bet I'm not going to buy into this Jem Hadar and the Dominion and stuff. And then when I actually saw it, I'm like, OK, they've they have done the job. Those guys took out a galaxy ship in round one. They teleported through like shields. Um, they are scary. And in this one. The Defiant, after we hear all this cool stuff about it, still feels like it is very much the underdog, very hunted and threatened when they are traveling through uh, Dominion space and, like, almost notice their their cloaking device, like, still is, like, imperfect and the, the Romulan operator, like, what are the, they kind of, like, what, run silent and they sort of figure out a way to, like, not get caught, but they nearly get caught. So it's super suspenseful. Yeah, when they have to drop out a warp because they're mm -hmm. they're kind of detectable at, at warp, and the Romulan woman uh, t to rule, I believe, she's like, yeah, we don't like to share that with people who. She was uh, introduced as a, as a new character, was supposed to be a, a recurring character. They kind of drop her, but uh, we also get Eddington, the uh, security dude. She was uh, she was not born to rule. <laughs> <laughs> I guess not, but. Uh, Eddington, he he seems like really boring to me, especially like compared to all the Deep Space Nine rich characters. That whole ensemble, even like the smaller recurring people, tend to have like very interesting aspects to them. But Eddington does eventually get a little bit more interesting. But we'll, we'll yeah, see right more now of him. he's not particularly on my radar. Um, uh, we'll we'll see as time goes by. But uh, yeah, I think um, having having the, the, the I don't know that the the Romulans do play a role in this episode, although it's sort of in a simulation, much of it, if <laughs> not all of it. And so, yeah, her role of just, I turn the, flick the switch and turn the cloaking device off and on, while it did sort of feel real, like I could buy, absolutely buy, that would be the price the Romulans ask for, um, she didn't bring the a dramatic, you know, persona to the table, and or, or like a catalyst for more drama, so... I completely understand why they kind of dropped that part of it. Whenever I'm binge watching DS9, I always get really excited when I get to this moment. Not only is like the reveal of the uh, Defiant so cool and coming off of the season two finale, the Jim Hadar do seem like such a big threat. And, you know, I I'm ready to go see more of the Dominion. But uh, the, the look of the show is it's like much better looking uh, with the new director of photography. Uh, the the guy they had the first two seasons, Jonathan West, or I'm sorry, Marvin Rush, uh, went to go work on Voyager, and then Jonathan West takes over on Deep Space Nine, hmm. and uh, he he uses a, a different uh, camera lens, and it makes everything look a little bit flatter, but like background stuff is more in focus. 
And yeah, I, I felt like you know I did not I would I did not notice that they had a change in director direct photography. You said, mm-hmm. um, but but I did sort of sense that things were looking better, and I was like, man, some of those shots of the Defiant, especially actually in some later episodes, I was like, just beautiful looking, great shots of the station and planets and stuff like that. So um, that that makes sense to me that this was a new a new DP there. And thematically, it ties into something that happens in this first. Uh, episode of the season with uh, Jake and Commander Cisco unpacking their uh, mm. f- ancient African art decorations because yep. uh, they're like we finally feel at home now on the station. So it, it, thematically, it ties into like the the, the place like looking more uh, like home, I guess. Yeah, I've read a little bit more uh, or read a little bit about some of the behind the scenes stuff, including wanting to. Um bolster the family thing and later episodes emphasizing Bashir and O'Brien and therefore removing Keiko from the station for a while. And obviously Odo and, and Kira start to percolate as a possible thing. So, so there's more of a familial bonding between them. Uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, I hadn't kind of considered how the visual stuff might sort of tie in with the thematics there. Yeah. And there's a lot of new stuff in season three. Like the defiant is obviously a new thing. And they explain the defiant in this new ward room set, their big, uh, their big meeting room. And that's where Cisco mm-hmm. gets into the details of, uh, well, it's, it's basically a warship, but officially it's an escort. And he, it's a ship. He saw the, uh, the design and the construction of back at the, uh, at the shipyard. And if you line it up with his timeline, it occurs, Shortly after Wolf three five nine, when Lacutus blows up the uh, USS Saratoga and kills mm-hmm. Jennifer Cisco, so it's like, oh, like my wife just died. I guess I'm gonna design this badass warship to go uh, fight the Borg to the point where he's a little overzealous. It's like almost too powerful. They say like it, it, it's gonna like oh, right. fly itself apart. He's been waiting to use his revenge ship. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he finally has a good actually... reason for it. I mentioned earlier there were two big things. The Defiant this was a minor thing, but I, I had no sense of really how, kind of how big and cool it was. Um, uh, and then I, I did not fully know that the founders were Odo's people, the Changelings. Uh, even though I'm, I know I had looked him up before and I had seen that, like, you know, Odo is a member of the uh, the founders or whatever. You know, I would have been in, like, a wiki stuff that I had read, but, it, like, it kind of hadn't just fully clicked that that was that the founder i was like oh wait and these dominion guys are called founders too uh i just uh only about like halfway through the episode was i was like <laughs> did i did i fully realize uh what i was seeing uh so i kind of still got the 1990 surprise uh not necessarily right at the very end when it when it's fully revealed but about halfway through i kind of uh, my brain finally clicked <laughs> into place <laughs> So yeah, that was the, exactly. the twist ending where mm-hmm. all the uh, all the stuff on the station was all faked. But that it does show like how big of a uh, galacto political clusterfuck the the Dominion are going to create. And it, yeah, it, yeah. Do you, Father, did you? It. I don't want to say it bothered me, but it, it slightly bothers me that the uh, the founders were like an oppressed people who kind of became oppressors. I. It's not like that hasn't doesn't have its world history. Like there is this kind of psych, uh, cyclical quality. I, I suppose, I, I, I guess it just reflects kind of a realism, but it is, it's just a grim thing to kind of recognize <laughs> that uh, people who were once being ground beneath the boot heels can become the people who with wearing the boot heels. Like, like Israel uh, being oppressive of the Palestinians. Uh, it's the, it's almost sort of immediately the most notable the and obvious example. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, a within the within a generation, essentially, uh, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, it's a strange so, phenomenon. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's just realistic uh, in that sense. But but poor Odo, he goes through like all these, you know, uh, René Abergenois gets to go through all these things of, that, that Odo doesn't normally show of like wonder and uh, exploration and excitement. And uh, he also just randomly puts his hands on one of them and just fucks her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they when they join like that, it's basically it's it's described as basically changeling sex. So that great link, that ocean of all the changelings, you know, melted together. They basically live in a continuous orgy. I mean, as uh, pitches go to join <laughs> to join back with your people, it's a pretty good one. 
it's gross, but it's good. Hey, strange new worlds and new civilizations. That's what the show's all about, right? <laughs> I dick, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, but I liked seeing them. I liked their discussion of uh, the, the also like the changeling philosophy uh, that um, what was it? It's like uh, they try and like embody what they the things, the very things they turn into um and um i don't know it just it just seemed like a cool idea um that they, it's like a spiritual in, inhabiting of the things that they're doing it sounds like in theory it would make you very empathetic and open minded to all these other races it's just that they have a long memory and they <laughs> have been stepped on yeah they're they're obsessed with uh with dominion with with dominating and and order maintaining order and it, it's interesting also how that has like manifested in odo he's always felt like a, a, a desire for order but with him you know he's always like seeking justice trying to you know like 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 see, the, see that the bad people are punished the innocent people are protected and it's something like he's very passionate about and then he, he sees where he got it from he's like oh like these people have always wondered about like they actually suck but yep. he realizes in finding his people, he realizes that his people are, you know, the people on the station. But yeah, thinking about his, like, sense of justice, very notably, we've seen him do, we've seen him occasionally look the other way. We know he's capable of looking for uh, the, trying to achieve real justice and not just the letter of the law, uh, like the episode that flashed back to Kira uh, when they, when they first met. Yeah, Necessary so, Evils, I believe. Yeah, super, super great episode. Um, but yeah, I, um, that second part, while intriguing, I was disappointed that it was a simulation. You wanted Garrick to stay dead. <laughs> yes, Father, I wanted Garrick's <laughs> death. Uh, right as I'm discovering what a great character he is. No, no, they, um, uh, what, uh, what I don't like is, like, watching 30 minutes and then being told it's 30, 40 minutes of something or an hour or something and then being told it's not, it's not the real deal. You may recall I was a little bummed out that, uh, it was Clone O'Brien in in season two who, what is it, fought that running battle against uh, what seemed like, you know, alien infiltration of the station. And I was like, oh, it was still cool. It still makes me think O'Brien is cool, but like it was a little dimin it diminished things a bit. And I, I definitely I liked the twist more then, though. Like, I, I, I felt like that twist was more rewarding than the one here. Yeah, it's. I actually thought that uh, the um, the changelings were impre impersonating Nechev and stuff like that, and that's um, that's in part because I did figure out a little ways into the episode that uh, I was like, oh right, those the founders are the changelings, and and then I think some of the things that happen, uh, accepting Garrick's death actually, um, were, were were interesting points and would have been, you know, whether it was isolating Kira and Odo. Uh, or destroying the wormhole, which I think you could have made a sort of temporary thing. Uh, I think those would have been interesting, you know, new, new, new jumping, new, new plot points to work with. So, yeah, I kind of would have rather it had they had been impersonating the Chev. But I think what they didn't want to do, and I get this completely, they didn't want it to become an invasion of the body snatchers thing, right? I don't know how they use the changelings in the future, but it seems like right at the moment, at least, it wasn't all about. Oh no! Who have they infiltrated? Does that become a thing well, later? Uh, you will find out soon if that becomes a thing or not. Might have a little bit I of hope... a might have a little bit of BSG, like who's the Cylon type stuff going on. I hope that they run into the conspiracy aliens, and at one point they're both talking, and they're like, "Wait, are you also an impersonating alien?" <laughs> yeah, like every everyone in Starfleet's an imposter. They're like, yeah, "Oh, like you're doing like... this too." This is embarrassing, but I'm also an infiltrating alien. Oh, that's uh, so funny. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but uh, but I still I still like the episode a lot, um, and the Odo stuff was all super interesting to see. Well, it gives him um, an arc. O Odo an has arc. has an arc now. He's gonna like explore his. You know, he's not gonna sleep in a bucket anymore. He's gonna he's 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 he's, he's gonna accept this part of his identity a little bit more. Well, it was a huge thing. Like, I, I like the symb symbolism when he says that he was – they were trying to get him to join their great link, their sort of ocean of, of changelings. And he says he's forged – you know, he's got links of his own already. I like that. Um, I liked – there's a line I jotted down just because – I don't know. I, I feel like it probably resonated with a lot of Trek fans. He said, 
they said he's always going to be an outsider, and then he says being an outsider isn't so bad. It gives one a unique perspective. It's a pity you've forgotten that. And uh, I thought that was an interesting philosophical point. I think they could have even discussed it more, but um, but it was um, you know some really good material for uh, Rene Abergenois to work with. Um, I, I one other minor argument or point though is like I had a hard time imagining that Kira could like chill out while he reconnects with his people, knowing that the Dominion could be wrecking the station and that Cisco could be dead and all that stuff. <laughs> it, that was that was a little bit of a stretcher. Well, she does keep asking, like, hey, can I use your phone? I really need to check on it. And there's like, no, shut up, solid. We don't yeah. like you. And then she's <laughs> like, and the, and the phone lines are down, too, which would, would of course, be uh, a big part of the big reveal later. Yeah, but uh, b- before we, we move on to, the, to our next episode, I just want to point out that the search part one is the first Ron Moore written episode of DS9. Oh, yeah. And then part two is the first Jonathan Frakes directed episode of DS9. So we get we get some cool talent from Next Generation right. spilling over onto DS9 with, with Next Generation rapping. They're, they're off to make movies. They're doing movies now. Yeah, and Frakes will direct a few more episodes just in the ones I've seen. Uh, he shows up a few more times. That's exciting to see. Um, he's clearly already knows what he's doing uh, and uh ron moore you know the the, the it, it, this seems to have like many of the qualities that he'll later have on his own show battlestar galactica um but but in my opinion i pro- hopefully at least with with stronger resolution <laughs> well he really fits into this ds9 writer's room like a hand into a glove and he he even like got to name the defiant mm-hmm. though he originally wanted it to be the the valiant and Rick Berman was like, no, we're doing this other show, Voyager, that's going to premiere in, in a couple of months. So we can't have Voyager and Valiant. That's too confusing. Oh, really? It can't begin with a V. So he's like, okay, it'll be the Defiant then. But Alan Moore, V for Vendetta, would have something <laughs> to say about that. He's like, I can pit, fit about 50 Vs into a single speech. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Star Trek had no room for both a, a Va- We did Actually, we see a USS Valiant. But it's just a one-off ship in, in a single episode. But later, it's it's coming up. We're not we're not there yet in season three. Defiance a good name. That they, they it ends uh, things worked out. I think. Yeah, and Ron Moore being a big TOS guy, it's a name that was used in the Tholian web. Uh, that's right. That's right. And then used again in Enterprise eventually, and uh, then in Discovery. So it's uh yeah we it's we made uh, its way we keep around Defiance. Yeah. But yet, uh, you got anything we... else on on the search parts one and two? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I think it was a, like a really strong kickoff to the season, though. Okay. Well, speaking of Ron Moore, he also wrote season three, episode three, The House of Quark. After Quark lies about killing a Klingon in his bar, the dead man's widow abducts Quark to the Klingon homeworld to marry him. <laughs> the synopsis <laughs> kind of makes me laugh, but it's it's accurate. That's exactly what happens. You know, um, I guess Ron Moore uh, isn't all grim, grim, dark uh, material. Um, well, he can do comedy. I mean, some people do don't com- like the Ferengi funny episodes, but I, I love all of the Ferengi screwball stuff. It, it made me laugh as a kid. It makes me laugh as an adult. I, I love this part of Deep Space Nine. I have slightly mixed feelings, and sometimes I, I don't love the like. I guess I don't even call this more superficial uh, Ferengi things like, oh, they get horny when you touch their ears. Oh, they're all greedy like sometimes it's a little on the nose uh but uh, i think this is actually one of the best ferengi comedy episodes i i I actually thought by the way fathery that it was not real when when he went to the klingon homeworld and was like in on trial and stuff Mm -hmm. i was like oh they've already done a virtual or like suggested virtual reality show i bet this is not that but that like Odo to teach Quark a lesson about lying hired some Klingon actors and is using the hollow suites and he's teaching him a lesson um, because he's going to end up like in front of a firing squad or you know what or in a duel <laughs> uh, so uh, then about halfway through the show I'm like no I'm pretty sure this is real <laughs> they they bring in a uh, Galron from Next Generation Galron right. actually appears in more DS9 episodes than TNG episodes but this is no, the first one we're going to see a lot of Galron though they, they're they're going to explore a lot of Klingon stuff going forward. I uh, I have a thing where I like sort of watching people uh, weasel out of things, <laughs> uh, like <laughs> dramatically speaking. Like, I got to root for him. It's like he's trying so hard. My God. Um, 
And so, yeah, he's got the business down and uh, he, he, you know, uh, I did like that Rom right away said, hey, if you pretend that you killed this drunken Klingon in the fight and he didn't just fall on his blade, what if his family comes? They just right away get to that. And he's like, what does he say? I'll, uh, he's like, I'll tell him what really happened and then I'll bribe them. It's a very Ferengi response to that. Yeah. And I like that the show acknowledged the danger right up front and then it immediately happens. And then it's like immediately like a lot of Klingon sort of legal and family matters is a little more complex than it looks <laughs> um and actually ends up being so kind of a fun throughout as there's all these twists and turns of family drama and uh i don't know kind of land rights and fa family titles st stuff going on that quark is pulled into and uh is sometimes sometimes on top of and is sometimes clearly wildly and over his head well, I always enjoy stories where, like, the person, like, being true to themselves and, like, doing, like, that, that thing that's kind of, like, unique to them is, like, what actually saves the day. Like, you know, like, Rudolph with his red nose. Uh, right. That so, Quark's business acumen and sort of sleazy ability to sort of cook the books. Yeah, <laughs> he like, sees that. Uh, secret strength. The the Klingon, the, the bad guy in this episode, Degore, he's the rival of uh, the dead drunkard Kozak. And has mm -hmm. been uh, attacking them through, with with money for years, you know, like devaluing his property and you know doing stuff with like the people that Co uh, Kozak was in, in debt to. And I, the scene that makes me laugh is when Quark is like going over like all the numbers with Galron and the Klingon High Council, and they're all like they're struggling to keep up with them on their little oh, yeah, pads they're, they're and stuff. Just, yeah, they're like, stop it. <laughs> yeah, there's like, it's I don't want to like hear any I more felt, of this. It's kind of how I, everybody I think felt when they were watching. Um, the Star Wars prequels, and you kind of wanted them to st to stop talking about tariffs. <laughs> oh yeah, like like, like, like trade route taxations, and <laughs> you're like, no, <laughs> yeah. enough, move on. Uh, um, there's, we delegates there's... move for a vote of no confidence, and <laughs> all of that. I I bought the way that the the fight, the duel worked out because you're right. Like yeah. obviously the Klingons are gonna be violent, <laughs> and they're not gonna you know they 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 don't mind like killing people to get their way. So how is Quark possibly going to survive this? And I think the way that they handle that, where he just like refuses to fight and, and he tells Rom at the end, he's like, yeah, but like if that didn't work, I would have been fucked. Like that was, that was <laughs> my last card I had up my sleeve. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that was great. The uh, Klingon was essentially shamed for being still eager to kill a defenseless guy. And, you know, and, and he, and in fact, the whole problem with Tagore is that, he was too too Ferengi like in a culture of warriors. <laughs> um, yeah, he he and he and Ra, uh, him wrong. He and Quark could have probably gotten along under other circumstances <laughs> since they use similar tactics. Um, uh, the episode opens with a cool Morn moment where uh, it's like a quiet night at the bar. Morn is the last customer still there, and he's talking to the uh, lady, and then. Like they, they, you don't really hear what they're saying, but like he gets up to leave and like he turns back to Quark and like gives him like the thumbs up mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, like Morn's getting laid tonight, I guess. <laughs> but then, and then Quark is like, uh, yeah, when, when Morn leaves, it's all over. Like I'm not getting any more customers tonight <laughs> except for this drunk asshole who can't pay his tab. Yeah. Morn gets a few, uh, he gets a few scenes, at least that I've already seen this season that are, that are pretty fun. Um, there's also a, a B plot that involves uh, Keiko. What she shuts down the school in this one? Yes, because a lot of a lot of people have moved with the Dominion threat. Yeah, I I actually I thought that was a cool like an interesting idea. I like that Cisco kind of is willing to, like go out of his way to like help Keiko be happy when he gives yeah. O'Brien permission to use one of the uh, the cargo bays for a a botany lab for her because. Yeah, like he doesn't get to like make his wife happy anymore because uh, Picard yeah. blew her up. <laughs> so it's <laughs> a good point. I, I like I, I like I, that he's willing to do that for someone else. Yeah, I totally liked that. Um, and at the same time, I was also a little put off that Bashir was so sort of transactional about how he thought about that stuff. Where he's like, "Oh yeah, flowers buys you like two days of peace, and you know, uh, you giving her this arboretum will buy you a month." And like he was thinking of it almost like uh, like paying her off or something to like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, she can you can pay her off to be happy for a while, and then you know, leave her or whatever." I don't. He didn't say that, but it, I didn't love the way he talked about it. 
Bashir actually gets some really good, I think, growth episodes in this season where mm-hmm. they push him into new and more serious places. But this one was a little bit more traditional Bashir where, you know, he was he was meant to be just a little bit of a cad. <laughs> yeah, they, they want to build more of the bromance between the two of them this season. So, right. Uh, does this end with the bit where he has the suggestion for Keiko to take the take the job? The as job a on Bajor. Yeah. Bajor. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, I, you know, I know that that's, um, was, it was a catalyst, you know, behind the scenes for, for O'Brien and Bashir to become uh, better buddies. Um, and maybe that's not real cool to like kick the girl out so you can have a bromance, but it also still felt realistic enough. Like, I, I don't think it's a bad plot point. I think it's the kind of thing that could happen in real life, uh, just to, uh, help, you know, your the spouse you love have uh, have a better, more fulfilling life. It, it it made sense to me. Yeah, and I tend to enjoy the Keiko O'Brien stuff more than a lot of people. I, a lot of people are like really mean to Keiko. They they don't like her, and, and at times like the show does kind of want her to be unlikable, where she has kind of being like the bitchy wife, so that we sympathize with O'Brien. Uh, but right. uh, she also gets like good moments too that I think are are criminally overlooked. So when when we continue to talk about these episodes, I'll try to point those out when we come across them. Sounds good. Uh, overall, I uh, rate this as uh, one of the highlights of the season. I think it was I think it was a super fun episode, though. Yeah, there, there's a lot of good ones here. Like, there's only two episodes in season three that I personally dislike. One of them we'll talk about today. The other we'll talk about in a future discussion. Uh, but uh, yeah, generally, like I, I really love season three. Um, season four, there's only one episode I dislike, though. And then season I five, like I, I like all have, of them. I might have already hit two I kind of disliked. Uh, both of which had some merits in it, but we're, we're getting there. We're getting okay. there. Okay. Well, let's move on to episode four, Equilibrium. Jadzia Dax is plagued by disturbing hallucinations that allude to the dark past of the Dax symbiont. Uh, this is the uh, big Trill episode where we go to the Trill homeworld and we see a lot of the same stuff again in Star Trek Discovery. Right, which was for me the first time I saw it. Uh, so this was uh, uh, this was me seeing it. Uh, my my second viewing was its first chronological presentation. Cool way to explore more of like the Trill culture, and we get to see like you know the symbionts in their cave and the the guardians, and learn about the uh, isoproamine or whatever it's called, the isoproamine levels. Yep. Uh, but 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 yeah, uh, Jadzia starts having like these memories because it turns out there is a there is a secret. <laughs> kind of like the the war doctor in Doctor Who, where there's like the secret doctor regeneration no one knew about. There was a, a secret Dax host that no one knew about, who was a uh, psycho killer, and it, it's, uh, yeah. it's starting to manifest in her personality. That was kind of nuts when I when I when they got to that. I was like, well, what? Um, and she, yeah, she's got creepy dreams based around it with lots of masks masks in it. I, I, I was fascinated. I would sometimes read the Memory Alpha has some kind of neat little notes and stuff at the end of their uh, write ups. And, and like sometimes an episode would begin its process, uh, its script stage so different from how it ended up. Like, I think that one was like actually inspired by somebody who had like masks as part of like, like a carnival act or like a, like a one man show or something like that. And they, they just wanted to do something with masks. Like literally that's all that it was. And then it somehow, it, you know, it spiraled into this, uh, this episode that's all about, you know, has a lot of history of the Trill, has some big reveals about uh, the, the Trill and who can and can't be joined. Um, but yeah, its gestation was very different from what it became. Uh, I like that uh, Terry Farrell, is that her name? Mm-hmm. Uh, that she got to kind of like get uh, act out and get to freak out on uh, Cisco and uh, Kira early on. <laughs> I, I'm sure it was... She's, you know, she's always kind of chill. She's, she's usually very laid back in a lot of ways. And she got to like get pissed at them and all accusatory and shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know you're cheating me in this game of chess, Benjamin. You, yeah. And then she was always like, knew you were a cheat. And then like Kira's like, Hey, calm down. And she's like, take your hands off me. <laughs> and she's like, that's the first smart thing you've ever done. <laughs> well, well, what's scary is if you think about it, like, Oh, she's probably like pretty close to like stabbing those people now. Right. Right, and she's like uh, as as Curzon and other people is like trained with Klingons, and like she could probably be really pretty dangerous in that in those cases. 
I'm not I'm not sure if they ever like specify a year like how many years ago this stuff was, but it, it's pre Curzon. This was the host right before Curzon. Right. So I always assume like Curzon was like a fairly young dude and got joined, and then shortly after that was like negotiating peace with the Klingons. You know, Star Trek Six. So I'm gonna guess like this probably happens like a little bit before. This is probably like you know during like Star Trek two or three or four. You know, those well. Well, Spock is being like resurrected on the Genesis planet. That's when Joran, the the music composer, is uh, uh stabbing people on on the trail. Yeah, the the violent that's that is a, a cliche. I can't say I see too often the violent music composer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, uh, but it, 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 you know that led to her having this tune she couldn't get out of her head, which. You know, uh, you know, if you see kind of like suspense movies and thrillers, it's the kind of thing that you would see in something like that about a like a repressed memory. Um, Were the and, Discovery uh, writers getting that idea from this episode too, when they put like the that magic piece of music in in season three because they they clearly watched this when they were writing that season is an three. Interesting point. I had not thought of that, but I sort of feel like it like it could be the case. Or at least like subconsciously. I think this one made more sense than the other one. <laughs> yes, and it has a cool ending when when Dax still knows how to play that on the keyboard. So it's yeah. like, oh, like that Joran stuff is still there in her, and, and they they bring up Joran uh, again well, uh, a couple times in, in the future. That was that was one of the questions I had about like follow throughs on some of these things. Um, by the way, I feel like you could also uh, have some fun overdubbing uh like the doors or you know whatever organ music when she's playing on her little <laughs> synth thing you could just go in you could throw in anything in there um the other thing though is that the big reveal the whole reason Duran was covered up was that the trill apparently uh the notion that uh unless you're like perfectly aligned uh a candidate for a symbiont your body will reject it is apparently not true and apparently like they say like half the populace would actually be a candidate not some minuscule amount but am I, if I'm remembering this, how this played out right, but since there's so few trill overall that there would be like violent fighting and stuff for everybody to get access to them. So it's a lie to protect the peace, right? Yeah. Well, in, in Discovery, they get the opposite problem where after the burn, they've lost so many of their their people that they don't have enough. Like now they're worried that they, they don't have enough hosts for the for the symbionts. Right. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, I mostly like this episode. Um, I think thematically the idea of making peace with the killer in you is kind of a neat idea. It reminded me of Kirk rejoining with his evil half in um, whatever episode. The Enemy was. Within. Enemy Within. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, ag aggression isn't isn't always a threat. <laughs> Although this guy is like a literal killer, right? His brother still loved him, though. I like the guy who played his brother. I, th I thought he was a he was an interesting old man. Um, he kind of buried the lead on his brother being like a <laughs> killer, um, but you know, I, I would sort of expect him to. I, I think he was a lonely old dude, and he was just glad that someone called him. <laughs> they just drawn <laughs> they out the they, conversation. They didn't show it, but like after, like they, like he just kept on talking, and they're like, I, I, "Cisco's like, I really have to go. I've got <laughs> got a thing." and He's like, well, I could come up there. <laughs> I guess I don't think feel like things super came together uh, perfectly. That, uh, especially if they didn't follow up on the trill reveal. But uh, but I but I thought it was a pretty pretty neat suspense episode with some cool yeah. trill backdrop. The only thing I have to add, I guess, is I like that it opened with like Cisco cooking for uh, you know Dax and Bashir, and you know, he he does seem like he has like a little bit more at home. You know, he's inviting his coworkers over. He's gonna yeah. It cook some good. Creole food for them. That was it. The beets that uh, Bashir didn't want. I'd I'd try his beets. Yeah. Uh. Why not? Now beets by Dre. <laughs> now we will move on to episode five. A second skin. Uh, Kira is kidnapped by the Cardassians, who try to convince her that she is really one of them. So yeah, this is a, this is a return to Cardassia Prime episode. We have some more Garrick and a lot of cool. Kira stuff and just me personally as someone like who like really loves Kira and I love going and seeing more Cardassian stuff and you know the Obsidian Order and all of that I never feel like I like this episode as much as I should or as much as like everyone else but I, it is good it just doesn't sing to me like the way I would expect it to what about you you know my feelings kind of changed on it as it was going along because 
as a premise, it's it's something that we've seen variants of the. I know Rikers awakened as an alien. Troy woke up as a Romulan. Um, I've I've sort of seen variants of the idea where somebody tries to ferret out some information by making you wake up and think you're not who you are. Uh, even Mission Impossible way back in the day has tricked people by like putting old age makeup on them and then making them think that, you know, like the statute of limitations has expired on their crime. So you can talk about an old man and then they're like, you're not an old man. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, they, um, uh, the, the the incidental writing and the ideas in it end up being so intriguing that I, I liked it a lot uh, by the end of the episode. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it pretty highly regarded? It sounds like people really like this one. I think so. And uh, and I, I'm not sure what in it bugs me. I guess I think it's like a little fishy that like this Cardassian girl looks and sounds so much like Nana Visitors that it's uh, uh, kind of weird that, that like she... When she plays like that recording of what the the Cardassian girl said before she went undercover, and it's like, oh yeah, that is actually like Nana Visitor's voice. Uh, that, right, that, that's right. a pretty big coincidence. But you kind of have to have that for the story to make sense. You know, you were talking about uh, how much you like uh, Nana Visitor and her uh, and Kira, and like definitely this is something that just continues to hit home every time I watch any more of DS Nine. Is that she may be my favorite character on the show. She's gonna probably walk out of this as one of my favorite Trek characters. Um, she, it's just a question of how high up in that echelon she's going to get, uh, you know, top five, top three. I guess I let some of the coincidences slip away because I wanted to enjoy, you know, watching her do what happens. And it is not the, we need you to give us the missile codes. It's a, we are going to do a long con and try and catch the guy <laughs> the Cardassian who's pretending to be your father. Um, yeah, well, you know, he, he that, thought he was her father. But, or that's yeah, right. Like, that's true. That's true. He, that they would use that, that paternal protection to, uh, to, to make him break. And, you know, given that they did reveal that, uh, what gold to uh, like essentially planted a war orphan years ago, just to one day discredit a political opponent, uh, with the reveal about it. Um, the Cardassians do seem to do some pretty Machiavellian shit. Uh, Definitely. I guess that, I guess that with that in mind, the plot doesn't seem that crazy. <laughs> and, uh, he's a pretty like likable dude. Like he just wanted to get his daughter back and, uh, th they, they follow up on, on this relationship between him and, and Kira. Like, like she's made like a Cardassian friend. So that's like some, some growth for her. Well, and the show, I, I feel like maybe even at this point in the game, that we've seen more diversity in, like, the Cardassians than almost any other race. Like, sometimes, like, Romulans are just, they're just always about the spy subterfuge stuff. And Until you get to Picard. Violent honor stuff. What's that? Picard fleshes out the Romulans. But yeah, right, it was, but it like was up overdue. To this point, um, you know, usually the, they, they still lean into the alien races are mostly one key philosophy is, is will define them. And, and yet I've seen a wide variety of Cardassians, even this only three seasons in, um, and, and like a, a lot of either caring Cardassians or even like kind of bad Cardassians, but who are not, you know, they're not doing it sort of, uh, you know, they, they've, they've just been raised that way, you know, <laughs> they're, they're part of a sort of the fashy cult and, uh, they, they just go they they go with it because it's how they were it was in, burned into them from childhood so so yeah you, like i feel like you see a lot of variety of of cardassian types even in a few episodes we're going to see uh gold ducat being uh sad that he's missing his kid's birthday uh, <laughs> yeah so. um and they follow up on the dissident movement uh, that was established in season 2 with uh, with quark's uh girlfriend uh, natima uh, and it's sad, like, we see, like, w this young Cardassian soldier who's part of, like, this dissident movement. Like, he's probably, like, a cool dude, and he, he gets vaporized by the Obsidian Order here. Right, right. Yeah, the Obsidian Order is pretty scary. It does seem like this was potentially their opportunity to quash the entire dissident movement. Like, I can see why this would be, however, you know, kind of whatever strings they had to pull in this to make it happen would be worth it to them. Uh, if they could do it. 
that it gives Garrick something to do in this episode. And I like I like how like he was like, hell no, I'm not going back to Cardassia Prime. And we still don't know exactly why or all the details or anything. But like, uh, Cisco, uh, Cisco blackmails him again. He basically does the we'll get you deported if you <laughs> if you don't do this. Uh, uh, Cisco, uh, once again, clearly not above some uh, manipulation of his own. When they're they're spotted on the way by the the ship out on patrol, and they have to fake the uh, that they're these uh, these cargo hauling, I guess basically like truck drivers, like from mm. Alien, uh, but they uh, don't pull that off. It doesn't work, and then Garrick has to like give them like that that command code or whatever. The, then the the Cardassian goal just completely changes to a different tune he's like oh my god i'm sorry i didn't mean to interfere uh yeah and if garrick says uh, oh just something i overheard while i was working on someone's trousers or something like that you know <laughs> yeah uh yeah garrick is great in this one um uh, just as i uh, always continued to enjoy more of kira uh garrick i like you know every time he gets a spotlight i can see like the writers seem to love writing for him uh he gets a lot he gets to actually kind of be a badass a lot um and sometimes uh it's it's like a badass because the acting ability is so good uh of the who's the actor who portrays him andrew robinson and, andrew robinson and sometimes he's literally doing something cool and badass like this you know like he'll be in a cool fight scene or he will um t you know talk like uh talk his way through something by being wildly confident and uh yeah i I loved Garrick and and throughout this whole whole episode, and, and he serves a good function in the show too. Because at the end of this episode, they kind of need to get the Obsidian Order off of of this guy's case, you know, or else like the dissident movement is is ruined. So uh, Garrick just kills that Obsidian Order operative because he, he's he's the guy who like he he can just you know you need a, you need someone dead. You we can't, probably can't have Cisco do it or Kira do it, but Garrick, <laughs> you know, he can just shoot this guy and no problem, yeah. you know? Yep. Yeah, no, uh, uh, you could, you could put together a, I've already seen again, just in three seasons, you could put together a great highlight reel of best of Garrick moments, uh, through just from these seasons. Um, I did think it was interesting that the, uh, the guy who, uh, you know, her father figure, her Cardassian father figure, yeah. which Leggett by the Gamor. way, that's a, super messed up thing that she had to go through and i love that she um at really at no point even though this was clearly hurting her and causing pain and psychological trauma at no point was she ever like oh maybe i am a cardassian no she was she was kicking them in the <laughs> face the whole time uh not metaphorically speaking uh and like saying yeah whatever your trick is like no i'm not gonna ever buy it um did you ever believe it but, were you like oh my god is kira actually a cardassian not really, but I was like, I was sort of doing the, where is this going? Like, I, I couldn't figure it out, and so I, I liked sort of the swerves it took at the end. Um, uh, but but I, what I was getting to was that, you know, her father figure says, don't trust Garrick at the end. He's like, whatever you oh, do. Oh, yeah. That's so and, ominous. And it is. And, like, and I'm like, oh, man, you know, like, I certainly, like, I like Garrick, and I don't want them to, I don't want that to be how people think about him. Uh, but... <laughs> We also, you know, know that he either, you know, that he he clearly in service to Cardassia has done some bad things. He's, you know, he he feels like he is one of those characters like Tyrion in um, Game of Thrones or um, uh, who was the eunuch? Um, Varys. Varys, who has no doubt presided over some awful stuff. Um, uh, or in his younger days, at least did some bad things. Uh, but like broadly has the Cardassia's best interests at hearts. I think he just thinks he knows what Cardassia's best interests are better than its historical line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, and he often seems to have the best interests of the deep space nine at heart. So, um, I, I was like, no, no, don't be a bad guy, Garrett. <laughs> it kind of makes him more badass though. Like, I think it'd be really cool if some... I guess we don't have a central command, but I, like, I don't know, a United States senator was like, don't trust that fathery guy. Like, whatever you do, like, he's so dangerous. <laughs> like, oh, that, that yeah. would make me sound pretty badass, actually. It's, it is definitely adds to the mystique. It definitely adds to the mystique. <laughs> um, um, the last thing I 
have to say on this is just that uh, Nana visitors hated the Cardassian makeup, and this was super hard I for her to do. That. And, uh, one day she actually like ripped it off, like with like with like on set. She's like, I can't do this. Uh, right, right. Yeah, like it must have been like a really pretty intense claustrophobia, and I feel for her because that that ain't no joke. If if like you really feel that, I you know anybody who's ever sort of felt vaguely suffocated by anything or had trouble breathing for even a second or two kind of knows the panic that that induces. So I, I feel for her and for all the Trek actors who, you know, have dealt with some, some stripe of that. I know it's not easy for anybody, uh, but uh, it sounded like it was particularly tough for her. Let's talk about season three, episode six, the abandoned Quark finds an abandoned Jim Hadar child. And Odo is the only person who can control him. So this is where we learn more about the Jim Hadar people through a mm-hmm. Jim Hadar baby that grows into a uh, very scary Jim Hadar adult man. Yep. Although that said, the uh, subplot uh, I think gave me my favorite line of the episode, where Cisco says, "Tell me more about my poet hustler son." <laughs> <laughs> well, this is something that you asked about in season two, and I didn't want to go too much into like giving anything away, Spoiler. but you asked if they. They follow up on on Marta, the Jake's uh, Dabo girl girlfriend, yeah. and uh, yeah, we get to see her in this episode, and then almost Actually, immediately after this, they they break up. I know. I, I I sort of get why they were not. You know, it's not quite like dating a stripper, but a Dabo girl, but a little bit in that ballpark, and I get why they were didn't want to like pursue that, but I thought they actually did a pretty decent job of fleshing her out over there awkward dinner conversation. I like seeing Jake be sullen about it and all that too. (laughs) Yeah. I was sad to see that Cisco's takeaway wasn't when O'Brien asked him about it. It wasn't that, Oh yeah, there was more to her than I thought. Uh, It was, Oh, there's more to my son than I thought because he just didn't know these, these facets of him. And uh, like, I get that his son takes priority, but like, I thought that the, they did a good job of showing her as someone who was uh, dealt with a lot of the, you know, standard, but, standard sadly Bajoran tragedy in her past who was working hard and you know it, he didn't love the Dabo girl you know uh uh or her age and that is a big age difference between 20 and 16 that'd be statutory in some some states here yeah well, uh, I mean they have limited options on the station so yeah <laughs> uh but uh but, but like I, I I did actually enjoy that subplot and I've I, I get why the writers were didn't want to re- keep going with it, but uh, nowadays I think they could have, and it might have been in, it might be interesting to follow through on it, uh, continue to keep a rounded uh, character out of someone who's, you know, a foot or two away from sort of sex trade sort of stuff. And you know, Jake doesn't start off a very interesting character in season one, uh, mm-hmm. and and they don't you know do too much with him. So uh, you know, how could he be very interesting? He doesn't have that much screen time, but they do grow him eventually into a very interesting character. And and you get a lot of that in season three here. And then in another episode, we're going to talk about in a moment. Uh, And Mm -hmm. I had never thought about this before. I was like taking down notes to do this podcast, but Cisco has the same approach to the dominion and Marta in both cases. He's like, well, I'm not going to like wait for this to come to me. I'm going to like proactively <laughs> confront this head on just so I can assess it and then decide what to do. That is an interesting uh, realization. Uh, I, I kind of like that, that uh, it does seem to be how he operates. He's not going to let something percolate and bother him. He will try and be proactive, uh, yeah, whether it's yeah. how his kid dates or the threat of the the danger to the entire at Gam- or like Alpha Quadrant and, and Bajor. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you, you do it with a cloaked warship, and sometimes you do it with Shrimp Creel, but hmm. it's the, the, same, the same method. Uh, I like that. I like what that. What about the, uh, the subplot? What about so, yeah, like let's, the, hit the, uh, let's hit the A-plot. The main, the main stuff with the Jim Hadar baby. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, it's, uh, you know, we, we've seen the sort of also uh, in Star Trek a rap- rapid aging plots. Um, but I don't think we've seen too many where it's like rapid aging in order to like kind of make them a quick soldier. Uh, I don't know if that's shown up ever before. And uh, certainly the position that Odo finds himself in as the one of the few people who on a, you know, sort of genetic memory level, the Jem Hadar def- defer to the fo- uh, uh, founders that, yeah, he ends up as this father figure for the kid. <laughs> and it parallels the, the B story with, 
you know, a father and son type story. And Mm -hmm. we like Cisco loves kids. He loves being a dad. Like when the baby is a baby, like he's like holding the baby and stuff. And he's like, oh, I I thought that was a neat little aside when he uh, talked about how he missed uh, missed when Jake was a kid. And yeah, it's easier to make happy. Right, right. There's a sort of like just almost more tactile way of like sort of making a kid happy. You can rock him and hold him and stuff like that. You don't have to <laughs> psychologically examine him. And, uh, and, and I, and, and, and Avery Brooks is really good at selling that kind of thing. And he also directed this episode. It was directed by Avery Brooks. Oh, not, is it his first one or? Uh, no, he, he started directing in season two, but he, he does at least one every year. I think he, yeah, he, he does cool. several in season three, but. Uh, yeah, he he likes to get behind the camera, and uh, the stuff with with the the Jim Hadar baby. I hate they never give him a name. He's just like unnamed this whole episode. But it, yeah, it, I was looking. It, it, it teaches up us I... more about the Dominion. Right. We see. Uh, well, you know, if it, it's it's a fairly sympathetic portrayal because he ultimately they roll with the notion that he cannot be deprogrammed, or at least their efforts were not enough, and uh, you know that he's just like built for combat he innately sees other people as inferior to him he creepily will say like oh i could kill that person you know (laughs) like how can they possibly interact with somebody who i could kill so easily he worships odo Uh, but not by the end by the end he's even like i can tell even you are not you know like uh uh, a founder in you know uh like like i was led to believe you're doing it wrong yeah exactly so Odo kind of gets uh, rendered impotent by the end of that too. Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty dark ending. Um, I, um, I I don't know that I have a whole lot to say about it. Oh, just, by the way, just a real quick aside, I noticed that the, uh, the, the, the the I believe it's the only other recurring role of the uh, of the chick who. Uh, brought the damaged ship that had the baby on it was the same person who brought the The earring earring. quark uh, in a previous episode she's like a freighter captain uh, who clearly kind of does illegal stuff and seems like she hooks up with quark once in a blue moon um yeah she gave him some umox i think to like get him to like buy that salvage (laughs) because the quark is even like ah it was worth it yeah (laughs) i got a I got an ear blow job from the freighter captain (laughs) oh no (laughs) um but uh but yeah like she's these are actually sort of two notable plots that she's inadvertently uh put her had her foot in because that earring led to the rescue of lee nollis which led to you know was a major factor in the like bajoran you know coup attempt to try and bring stability to it so i I, this that that character I, i i think i read somewhere that maybe she has like she shows up in one of the books but it's a supporting character that i think some I kind of like the idea of a uh, a smuggler who's kind of on the periphery of some sort of notable stuff. When but... you need a MacGuffin to show up on the station, you just have <laughs> her like, be like, Quark, I'll rub your ears if you buy this from me. Yes. And there you go. There's your She's plot like, device. I, I bought a cut rate Guardian of Forever. Is this something that y'all can can, can work with? Uh, um, <laughs> yes. Um but yeah, this is the first time I think we've had any real sympathy for the Jem Hadar. I was just talking about how the Cardassians have all this, mm. um, you know, nuance to their portrayals, and not every Cardassian is portrayed as uh, being this kind of uh, big brother, 1984 fascist. Um, but uh, the Jem Hadar had prior to this, and so at the very least, we see sort of that they very much have their roles forced upon them. Yeah, and they're also like born with a uh, crack addiction. Basically, they they have to have right. like this narcotic or they die. So that that's how much control the uh, the founders want to have on these super soldiers. Uh, that, that could be, I guess, dangerous to them if they weren't uh, totally like held under the the founders' thumbs with their addiction to Ketracel White. Yeah, I guess this 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 episode in some ways is as revealing of the founders as it is of the Gem Hadar. Because, yes, you, that means that they did all these things to them. Even though they're off screen in it, they were the engineers of it all. So, fuck you, founders. You're a bunch <laughs> of jerk faces. And you remember Tosk, the uh, the in- guy who could turn invisible, who was hunted in season yeah. one and became buddies yeah. with O'Brien? Uh, his design is kind of similar to the 
Jim Hadar and the uh, the makeup dude Michael Westmore has suggested that uh, he might have also been like a genetically enhanced creation of of the Dominion. Um, like the Dominion, like sure. made them to like, give like those hunters like something to hunt or something like that. Yeah, I li- I like that. I think that'd be a neat expanded universe reveal, a little little thing to drop in somewhere. Are you ready for uh, season three, episode seven, Civic Defense? I am. Cisco, Jake, and O'Brien accidentally trigger an old Cardassian security system that believes the occupation is still going on, and the station has been taken in a Bajoran workers' rebellion. You know, basically, the uh, the station's computer is trying to, to kill them, and uh, they're, they're in trouble unless they can get the, the right codes or, you know, whatever they need to do to, like, shut it down and get it out of, like, attack mode. Yeah, I was trying to figure out if I had seen this plot play out before. Um, I've, you know, it's a, it's, I guess, sort of a variant of, uh, you know, once Gold Ducat gets caught in his own trap, of sort of uh, the old uh, Dukes of Hazard, Boss Hog, and uh, somebody else trapped in a bank vault together and forced to make <laughs> their peace. But I, I don't quite remember. I can't recall seeing it uh, exactly. Um, and and I thought it was a kind of a neat neat suspense plot, uh, you know, just a um, because basically they are always extending the clock just a little bit longer, you know. And I and I like that. I like a kind of a good suspense thing where that um, uh, the the scythe is like hanging over them the whole time. I like that little refinery area that they're in. Uh, if you check out the seventh rule, the uh, podcast that uh Sirach Lofton does um mm-hmm. that uh, was originally with with Aaron Eisenberg but um you know before he sadly passed away mm-hmm. but he tells like the story about you know when he was a kid playing Jake Sisko shooting this episode uh Colomini like crawled through that that little crawl space area and he was like oh my god like there's a bunch of spiders in there and then like right before like Sirach had to like go in there as Jake and there wasn't any spiders in there but he was Colomini had like convinced them that there was and so he's like really scared to go in there <laughs> <laughs> what an asshole! That's uh, that's uh, that sort of sounds like what I would expect of him, though. Uh, that's that's messed up. He's messing with the kid. Uh, he's a prankster. Um, uh, by the way, I loved uh, the the kind of the recurring, um, I guess, uh, tempo of the episode is set by one recording after another of of uh, Gold Ducat appearing and saying like. What is he like? Attention striking Bajoran workers. Yeah, a- yeah. attention Bajoran workers. That's a meme. That there's a meme template of of ah. Gold Ducat on that screen saying like attention Bajoran workers. Right. This is like where the, the all the variants of like you know the beatings will continue until morale improves or something like that. Yeah. Um. I, I now that now I, I you said that and I was like oh I have seen that I had forgotten that but yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it's actually pretty great, uh, like a neat bit, uh, when, well, first of all, it's like Cisco gets frustrated and he's like, I hadn't realized how much I hated his voice until now. <laughs> but then of course he himself becomes victim of, uh, Cardassian duplicity when he kind of, uh, gets in a bit of a spot and then like his superior appears and he's like, I see, see you have betrayed us, Gold Ducat. It's like, you will be, th- uh, you will also die with the workers <laughs> for having yes, sided with them. It's, uh inception it's like like uh like cardassian uh safeguards uh, inside a cardassian safeguards uh, yes. he's so cool though when he comes over to the station when he's like just standing there in ops while the the phaser is like blasting at everyone but it's not going to shoot him so you can just like right you know now, walk around and lord over just them some random person so we know it means yeah. business yeah it's like a red shirt death yep and he's just standing there kind of talking in his gloating style and uh, talking about like the uh, what he's going to force them to, you know, the uh, concessions he's going to force from them to to help them out, uh, when yeah suddenly things go wrong uh, for him as well. Um, the episode um, I, I, it does a, it does a bit of interesting stuff where they break up interesting groups of people. Uh, you got um, the father and son, you know, as well as O'Brien working together. And you have Quark and Odo stuck together and kind of bolstering each other's spirits a little bit uh, as they, uh, with a little bit of grudging, uh, reveals they kind of complement each other. Gold Ducat and Garrick uh, have to like work together. <laughs> I love the uh, moment between Quark and Odo. I was actually like replaying this episode while I was working on something um, 
uh, night before last, and uh, I just had this on in the in the background, and I I laughed out loud at the moment when Quark tells Odo like, uh, yeah, the, like the reason why the Cardassians you know locked you in to your security office is because you know they knew you were a, a man of of honor and like couldn't be trusted, and it, it, it's like a compliment, but then like he adds on to it like and. Um, now your honesty is going to get us killed or, you know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, such a quintessentially sort of quirk thing is like, he can't, uh, can't <laughs> just let a uh, compliment hang there. I love the Ducat and Garrick stuff we get here too. And, and we still don't know why Ducat hates Garrick, but we get a little tidbit that's something to do with like du Ducat's father. Where it, right. He... That's right. And also like Garrick outs what I guess is real that Ducat has a thing for Kira. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty messed up. That's because of the way they treated the Bajorans. It feels a little bit like, uh, like a plantation owner who took a liking to a slave. That's exactly what happened. And they, we find out a lot more about, but yeah, like, like when Ducat was, uh, running Terok Noor, he, that's, it sounds like he basically had just like a running faucet of like a uh, Bajoran woman. Oh, that's awful. Um, yeah, he's he's a scummy dude. He is, but they do like to give him some nuance, which is interesting. Um, uh, but yeah, like so, so like when it happens, he's clearly like kind of really pretty angry at Garrick for revealing that. And uh, uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting to watch his reaction. It was a rare case of him being taken off, caught off guard, and sort of being so sort of look seeming a little defenseless. Uh, and there's also yeah. a little bit of like a like a sassy gay dude like uh <laughs> like frustrated with like this like horny straight guy trying to mac on the on the lady like the yeah, sassy yeah. gay dude's like oh we don't have time for that yeah yeah he's like put it in your pants <laughs> um yeah garrick is so so awesome when um, ducat flicks the baseball off of cisco's desk to kind of like it, it it feels like he's like taking like the cisco flag down to raise the the ducat flag back onto terok noor yep that baseball, I keep telling you, like it's like it, it's like in baseball, like keep your eye on the ball because they do some cool stuff with that baseball later in the show. So like it's uh, I like that we get like a little reminder of it here. Yeah, that's interesting. I um, you know, we were talking about um, were you talking about Gold Ducat when he's standing there while the beam is going off mm -hmm. earlier? Because, like, Garrick also gets to be kind of cool in this episode uh, when he, like, first shows up. It, the, like, a force field drops for him. And I, I forget exactly how it is he, um... Was it just because he was Cardassian or was yeah. something o else? Yeah, only the Cardassians can, like, move from, like, room to room. Everyone else okay. is locked in. But, yeah, it's another case of Garrick. Just very often he is, seems able to just casually circumvent the rules. And I always like seeing him do it. <laughs> um... Uh, it's also interesting that the stakes do continue to rise throughout the episode, going from a few people might get poisoned to the whole station is going to blow up. Uh, just uh, pretty classic suspense style. Um, I, I don't have a lot to say about its structure, other than I think it would have been easy for it to kind of fall apart um, and just be kind of like, oh, they're in another death trap. Well, they're in another death trap. But by kind of raising those stakes, by bringing in players like Gold Ducat, and by having like all these in interesting kind of like side conversations uh, with you know Odo and Quark and all the rest, uh, I think I, I think it was like a just a really good solid standalone episode. Well, let's move on to uh, an episode that I don't think is solid, uh, but uh, <laughs> the 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 one I don't really like that we're going to talk about today, season three episode eight Meridian. Jadzia yep. falls in love with a scientist on a planet whose inhabitants shift between this universe and a plane of pure energy re-emerging every 60 years. Back on DS9, Quark tries to obtain a hollow image of Major Kira for an erotic hollow suite program for a wealthy patron. Neither A nor B plot are great. Okay. I actually like the B story in this one. So it, it, it redeems the episode a little bit. I, I still wouldn't say I like it, but I, mean, I, I do enjoy the B story. Famous, certainly leads to a famous image. <laughs> that haunted um, me as a kid. I like. I, I, I wish I hadn't seen that. Like, it, it freaked me out. I feel like I would have been looking at dirty magazines and suddenly I would mentally superimpose Cork. <laughs> wow. Um, but uh, the... 
so I, I was reading up on this, and I, and I, it didn't occur to me while I was watching it, even though it should have been obvious, that the plot is ripped from a uh, old musical called Brigadoon. I don't know if you've ever seen it um, or know of it, but it's, it's, it's about like a mystical Scottish, almost like fairy tale like glen, a vi- like a village that only appears every hundred years, so that, where it's like still kind of like old country, like a quaint, beautiful village with happy people living in it. And uh, if if you if you happen to be there on the day it appears, you could go and like live there, and uh, so that was their space brigadoon uh, mm. sort of thing. Uh, it's a solid solid musical from like the fifties uh, with some a few really good numbers if you catch it, but um, maybe sixties. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know I think whenever they kind of try and have somebody fall like really fall in love with somebody in just the space of an episode. There's always the risk that it just kind of rings false. It just kind of feels a little hollow. Did you? I, that's how I felt. Did you feel that way? Yeah, it's hard to buy that Dax would be so, like, head over heels for this dude that she'd be like, you know what, I'm just going to leave Starfleet for 60 years and go be a energy bean with him. I, yeah. I get that, like, well, you only have, like, a short window, so if that's what you want to do, like, you better do it. And, and Dax is so old and long-lived that I could kind of see... Dax being like, well, you know, this is something new I haven't tried before, so I might as well do it. But he's kind of a lame dude. Like, I don't get what was so, like, uh, you know, someone, like, as cool as Dax, when she see him? Well, right. Early on, he's just, like, they do. They have a scene where they, like, hit it off, like, over dinner while everybody else is, you know, kind of getting to know the other inhabitants of this uh, space brigadoon. And, yeah, he doesn't really say anything that's that interesting. He seems fine. You know, but they kind of do that thing where Dax has to be like, oh, oh, what, what, you know, how interesting of you to say that. And like, you know, I'm like, I guess I feel like Terry Farrell is kind of being forced to do something she that that is not there on the page. The script does not contain the words that you need to have to see somebody wooed like that. Like compare that conversation to the conversation between Cisco and Dax, that heartfelt goodbye, which actually is a very good scene when, when he's like in tears, he's like, next time you see me, I'll be 90 years old. I'll probably be like a great grandparent. And then she's like, I'll call you old man. And like, that's that's a good moment. That scene is so good. It almost makes the whole episode worth it. Um, There was a, there's a really beautiful bit. I thought where, he embraces her and they hug and then he kind of walks out without saying another word and you just briefly see his face and he looks really pained. He looks like he's about to break down in tears and like he had to walk away before it happened. Um, and, um, and and I actually have several times throughout not just this show but this even this season I've seen a few – some of the actors pull that off, real tears and um, – it's you know it's really impressive when they do it. It's it, it actually seems very real. So a great scene in a otherwise kind of meh episode. <laughs> Speaking of great scenes, this is a very minor like two second scene when um, Quark is trying to connive Kira into like going to the Hollow Suite so he can scan her to make this porn program basically out of her. Um, yeah, he's making deep fake porn. Yes, that is exactly what it is, and they just need to get the scans in. And so uh, he's like, oh, hey, you're my millionth customer, and you've won this bottle of wine and these chocolates or whatever and a trip to the Hollow Suite. And she's like, I don't really do the Hollow Suite. And he's t- trying to talk her into it, and she's like, oh, hey, I've got a friend who this would be a perfect gift for. Oh, I'm going to go give it to him. And he walks off, and he just looks to, like, Rom, who's nearby watching, and his expression of, oh, f- fuck it all, he's just kind of like, <laughs> like, kind of like laughing with just despair. Uh, it's so it's so funny. It's so good. Go back and, and people should go back and watch just that one scene. <laughs> well, the reason why I like it is because of the, the character Tyron is played by Jeffrey Combs, who, Dave, you probably know from the Reanimator movies. I have I saw them I saw the first one like in the eighties and that I haven't revisited since so like it's a it's kind of a gap in my horror knowledge I need to revisit someday. But, but he again. also plays a uh, Shran the Andorian in Enterprise I, I know you've, right. you've seen and some of Shran. He's, a big, he's the big the big Star Trek character actor. Yes, he he will play two more characters in DS Nine. This dude is a one off, but the next two are recurring characters. Uh, you you haven't met them yet, but they'll show up eventually. And he also shows up on Voyager, and he plays a uh, Ferengi also on Enterprise in addition to Shran. So yeah, he he's he's kind of like Star Trek royalty just because he's he's done so many memorable recurring characters. And 
He is a, a guy that the fans want to see show up in Strange New Worlds. I don't know if we'll we'll get that, but a lot of people a lot of people want Just him to be like, like Doctor Boyce from from the Cage, the the Doctor. Mm -hmm. And I was like, he doesn't really look like that dude. Oh, like oh people, they want him to people, actually people, like play that. Interesting. Yeah. I don't think we'll and, see Doctor Boyce in like, that show though. They just want that continuity, that lineage of supporting characters from him, right? Yeah. I, I'd love to see him show up in any of the new shows as, as a new character. And it... Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I, 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 when I was making my notes, I realized there's a few interesting things about this episode that I overall don't particularly like. Uh, one is that um, I actually really liked the scene early on where Kira does what uh, a billion, billion women have no doubt done before, which is to very briefly pretend somebody is their boyfriend to get some skeevy D-bag to leave them alone. Yeah, and uh, Odo is so uncomfortable with that. He's very uncomfortable, but when she walks away, he's, like, looking at the hand she was holding, because he, he awkwardly plays along. He's looking at the hand she's holding, and it's as if it's the first time he's ever experienced any sort of physical touch that meant something to him. And, and like, it's kind of sweet. Uh, it's it's kind of... Uh, well, I guess I was... Her, his joking... Um, uh, her joking affection has clearly triggered some real affection for him. And it's a little bit sad and sweet at the same time, which is how I feel about a lot of their sort of subsequent scenes and in, in, uh, in episodes to come. But I enjoyed that. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, I, I like when Bashir was uh, busting uh, Jadzia's chops over uh, Quark, letting her win at Tongo. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, yeah. He kind of revealed that, and she's like, no, he doesn't. Uh, but yeah, overall a weak episode. <laughs> well, the next episode I think is a uh, much much stronger one. Uh, season three, episode nine, Defiant. Even though it has a weak title, they they do get better at the DS9 episode titles in season four. Uh, but uh, yeah, this this feels very TNG ish. Uh, yeah, as a title or like Cardassians in season two. Yeah, but uh, great episode, uh, weak ass title. When Commander William T. Riker from the Enterprise D arrives on Deep Space Nine, he takes a liking to Kira, who gives him a tour of the Defiant. But Riker is revealed to be not who he claims to be when he attacks Kira and steals the Defiant. So yeah, this is the one with Riker, but not that Riker. It was exciting for me because I had a feeling that, like, I, I knew some of these, uh, you know, TNG characters showed up. I didn't know any time anything about when it was going to happen, and I was as fooled as everybody else was. So uh, when he, when it happened, and I even like when he when pulls he, like, off he, the sideburns and just reveals like yeah. the goatee. Uh, well, hell, when he like talked shit to O'Brien, he's like, "I don't have anything to say to you, O'Brien." I was like, "Oh my god, what <laughs> what is going on here?" Um, uh, and I, it, uh, I, I that's actually an interesting sort of somewhat subtle bit where it was clearly just I guess to get him off the the, the bridge. But they never actually say it, I guess, do they? Yeah, they they, they don't really follow that up. But O'Brien like gets off and he's like, he looks so sad. And then he's like, that was really weird. But well, that, right. that, it was, that like, was realistic. Like, that's how you would react, it right? It was totally realistic. Like, you're so dumbfounded that somebody talks shit to you like that. And then you just kind of like say, okay, and walk away. And then you're like, wait. Uh, then you like turn it and get over in your head. Yeah, it's actually very realistic. Yeah, it'd be uh, like if you were like at the grocery store and like you saw someone you used to work with and you say hi to them and they're like, I don't have anything to say to you, Farabee. I think you know why. Yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd just be like, whoa, that was weird. Um, yeah, no, I uh, I really like that. Um, I had forgotten the episode that even had uh, was it Thomas Riker? Is that what we Tom? Do we what what do we call him? Yeah, Thomas Riker. That, that, that featured him, uh, but um, uh, quick to pick up on, one of the many cases where I like DS9, and there's more to come even in this, these first 13 episodes, where they reference some Trek lore in a way that's really cool. And uh, so I thought this had this was really cool. It, it, it got to be fun for Jonathan Frakes, because I, he got to be like an edgier kind of Riker, but he still got to be kind of Riker. Um and it was a uh, it was like a submarine hunt episode. Yeah, we also get more Obsidian Order. Um, we get more Gold Ducat. I love when Ducat is in the ward room and O'Brien and and Cisco are explaining like the transporter duplicate accident from like the Potemkin and and this mm -hmm. guy is like joined the Mach and, and Ducat's just like yeah the Central Command's not going to believe this phony baloney story like this this just sounds like some <laughs> weird stuff like 
<laughs> you know, it's almost in a weird way. That's almost like, well, I don't know if it'd be more meta if they would believe it or wouldn't, uh, because I'm like, well, these things are pretty common in Star Trek. So like people, the Cardassians should have experienced some sort of their own weird transporter incidents. But at the same time, I don't like when you kind of like get overanalyze Trek and say like, oh, they shouldn't have a holodeck because of all the deadly accidents that happen on it. I'm like, it's just a plot device. Don't overthink it. It was just a plot device. Uh, and so, and I, and I guess on that level, it does sort of make sense. I would rather that they not be talking about like all the crazy transporter incidents uh, than that, uh, than that you just readily, and you just readily accept that it happens all the time. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, as I was watching this one and um, Cisco was forced to work with the Cardassians to kind of hunt him down. Uh, well, first of all, I wasn't expecting an episode that would have as much discussion uh, of like uh, different ways to be a terrorist. Like Kira and like uh, Thomas Riker are like, she's like, you're going about it all wrong. And he's like, <laughs> well, I'm not, a, I'm a different terrorist than you. Okay. He's like, this is how I terrorize. <laughs> and she's like, she she does she divines that he wants to go out in sort of a blaze of glory to define himself and and all that. But it is it's just so deep space nine that there would be some conversations between characters, both of whom are really fairly honorable people that we like, about different terrorism methods, what works best. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that idea of like terrorists don't get to go out in a blaze of glory and like you know, that like that's not why you, that's not why you do this. Yeah, it has to be like yeah. a, it has to be more selfless than that. Yeah, she was uh, when she's like you're doing it wrong. It wasn't just tactics; it was like philosophy of it. Uh, and she had she had divined that he wasn't like he wasn't altogether about the mucky cause that he it was as much a personal reason for him as anything. But it, it's still very much in line with what we saw of Thomas Riker in Next Generation, and it, it kind of you know feels like a sequel to that episode. And that he, he has the chip on his shoulder; he needs to outdo William Riker. Yeah. Um... I believe I read that they do not follow up on his story, which saddens me because what a cliffhanger. Yeah, he's in a Cardassian prison with uh, that Bajoran Ensign Cito from, from Next Generation that who who died, but everyone thought like they, they can bring her back someday, and they just never got around to it. Yeah. Like, the two of them are like in Cardassian prison. Like Maybe one day, the, and may, Honestly, maybe a if they, row is there too. If they did a thing on Discovery or something with it where like, this, you know, Frakes gets to re recur, but not as Riker, but as as Thomas. Uh, I, uh, I, that'd be, I'd, I'd probably be about it. I, I, I know it's probably not a diversion they would want to do, but if they could find a way to work it in, I, th I think lower decks. Know. If anyone's going to do it, it's going to be lower decks. I was going to ask: Is Jonathan Frakes the biggest crossover character in Trek? Yeah, he has been around. He's been even on. Got his, he even made it to Enterprise. Yeah, he's been on every. Way show except for the original series the animated series and uh discovery but he's directed a lot of discovery right that's pretty impressive uh that's pretty impressive i got to see him on discovery now um so one of the notes i made while i was watching this episode was that while they're hunting them there is a lot of techno babble that's thrown around so like how they're tracking them how they're avoiding being tracked and you know, Obsidian Order stuff that even Gold Ducat didn't know about that's going on. Oh, those and ships was... that they're building. They're not supposed to have their own ships. Oh, right, right. This would be, yeah, like, yeah. This would be like if the CIA, like, surprised the Navy, and they're like, oh, we have our own ships. Yeah. Like, we're building, like, <laughs> no, a secret it's, fleet. It's kind of cool because Gold Ducat is, uh, once again, on the defensive. It's one of those things, that, in addition to, like, he has to miss his kid's birthday for this, that make you sort of feel sympathetic to him because, like, yeah, there's clearly, like, these elements within his own you know world as as awful as he is there's i don't know if not more awful people then there's at least backstabbing going on and secret power plays and coups that are out of his control just on a sort of basic level of like oh that would suck to find out <laughs> like uh <laughs> that uh i feel for him a little bit uh, in this one I like but, picturing him at like disney world in shorts and a t-shirt because he says like he was supposed <laughs> to take his kid to the amusement park yeah. Um, you know, he's probably like, uh, he's probably one of these dads who's, a, do you think he's like one of those militaristic dads who's kind of like, like, well, you've got uh, 30 minutes, kids, go enjoy the rides. Uh, your mother and I will be having drinks here and um, uh, don't, don't be late. You know, curfew is at seven. And do you think he's like, hard no, I, th like I think he, I think he would actually be like the parent who like plays with them. He's like a good dad. 
Um, what I was going to say about the techno babble is that it was always extremely clear to me what the tactics were. That they were just standing in for things that were normal. That you know, like they like couldn't say like, oh, we're gonna we can use our heat sensors and and find the turbines of their submarine. They were doing that kind of stuff. They just used futury words yeah. because anti protons. It, make, it would not make sense for them not to. Um, and I and I thought it was all clear, and it made me think. You know, sometimes techno babble gets that, that as as an is almost just assumed to be a slightly pejorative word, and it shouldn't be because they used it very well in this episode. It was never oh, too complicated, and it was never less, never anything but perfectly clear what their tactics were. So I thought that was cool. Uh, I, I sometimes like it. it was written like by Ron Moore. Ron Moore knows how to write yeah. that stuff, I guess. Yep. Yeah. And in fact, I thought he went too far with Battlestar Galactica and taking <laughs> removing any techno babble sort of from the discussions, or almost all of it. He also drops not one but two forty sevens into this episode. Oh my There's God. the uh, Cardassian outpost forty seven, and then Kira's uh, code to like turn over uh, access to the Defiant to yeah. to Riker. Her code is like Delta five four seven. I uh, I'm gonna have to drop a star from my <laughs> review now. You know, um, it occurs to me that there was a p part of what I liked was even though I, I know this also saved on special effects. But when you, you know, there's a lot of times when you just see the ships on like a grid on a computer grid and you're just looking at like an abstraction of them. It's like looking like a battleship or something like that. But I liked it. Um, it reminded me of kind of the uh, scene where they're watching the, the, the in, in the Tom Clancy movie. Um, oh, shit. It's the second. Uh, it's the first one with Harrison Ford. Um, the Hunt for Red October? No, it's the one right after that. Harrison Ford took over from Baldwin. Uh, not clear, clear and present danger. No, it's the one. Where, Patriot Games. Patriot Games. There's a scene where he watches everything from uh, satellites as like there's a mission, uh, and they watch they watch it on uh, like uh, satellites with like night vision as like a terrorist camp uh, is like wiped out by commandos, and it's really eerie and kind of weird and removed. It's the same thing you get with drones and stuff nowadays, where it's kind of both disturbing and on some level impressive to the technology. Uh, anyway. It's it's a kind of it creates an interesting push pull dynamic I think when you when they do stuff like that and they they were doing it throughout this episode where yeah to the generals and stuff behind the scenes the it's almost like moving around these abstract little dots and then they you know you'll cut to the interior of of the defiant and you see the real human stakes and I I like that push pull I felt bad for the crew when they're like oh yeah we're gonna surrender and you know uh, and all this and and uh, they're like, what now? <laughs> but I like seeing like the negotiation process with Cisco and Gold Ducat about like, okay, cause it was like, complex. Gold, Gold Ducat just wants to like blow up the Defiant, and Cisco's mm -hmm. like, well, no, no, I, like I really like that ship. I want to keep it, but like, uh, I, I need, I need the the crew to be turned over to the Federation. And, and Gold Ducat's like, no, like someone has got to answer for this. Like they're not going to blame this on me. They got to blame it on someone else. And. Mm -hmm. But he's like, okay, you can have Riker, but not the death penalty. <laughs> All that, yeah, like the no, back and actually, forth of that. They they get into like the nitty gritty of negotiating it uh, a little bit, not boring stuff. Like it happens in a pretty interesting way. But yeah, I agree. That was that was cool to watch. And um, some cool. It felt, uh, it, felt, it felt real. Some cool continuity stuff in this episode. Thomas Riker calls the Defiant a tough little ship. Will Riker says the same thing about the Defiant in First Contact. Yeah. Um, also, uh, we have the character, I think her name is Kalita. She, one of the Maquis people, she was in the TNG episode Preemptive Strike, where Ro runs off and joins the Maquis. Oh, so she is, she's a Maquis we've seen before? Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, that's it's, very cool. It's the first use of quantum torpedoes in Star Trek. I wondered when I heard, when I heard that mentioned, uh, I, I wondered about that. By the way, lots of great shots of the Defiant in this one. It looks cool as hell. And this also has uh, the woman who played Rachel Garrett, the captain of the Enterprise C in uh, Yesterday's Enterprise. Mm -hmm. And then she plays a, a Klingon woman on, on TNG also, but uh, Trisha O'Neill, uh, she plays the uh, Obsidian Order Observer Lady. Yeah, yeah, the, who, who kind of undercuts a lot of <laughs> Garrick's authority in this one. Uh, We're at fun to, fun to watch. Uh, the only thing I think I kind of disliked about it is a very minor thing overall was uh, that uh, Kira would like particularly fall for Riker. I, I know Riker has like he kind of does the James Bond everyone is charmed, but didn't particularly seem like Kira's type. <laughs> uh, 
so uh, the his like uh, his old timey kiss to her at the end sort of sort of rang a little false. He's also going to prison for life, so he's like, I will probably never see another woman the rest of my existence. So I, I cut him a little slack. Uh, I guess I buy it from him. I don't know if I buy it from that that she would be so such a willing recipient, but uh, uh, it didn't uh, didn't particularly hurt the episode either. And I do want to I do want to learn of his fate one day. Jonathan Frakes is uh, such an easy get that uh, I wouldn't be surprised with all the Star Trek in production. Wouldn't be surprised if, if they do follow up on it somehow, someday. All right, uh, let's move on uh, to the uh, Deep, Deep Space Nine version of uh, Naked Time, Naked Now. <laughs> yes, uh, Season 3, Episode 10, Fascination. Ambassador Luwaxana Troy visits the station to attend the Bajoran Gratitude Festival resulting in an outbreak of passion throughout the station. Sorry, that makes me laugh. An outbreak of passion. Uh, <laughs> as people admit their secret feelings for other, They don't admit their secret feelings. They just develop a they, thirst they for each other. They say in the episode that there had to be some latent attraction if it, if it for when it activated. Yeah. They said it's like something like on the subconscious level. And then Bashir's like, try not to think about it too much. Yeah, because, like, Bashir and Kira have never had a particular thing, but that is what happens in there, so... Um, well, uh, all, off-camera, like, the, the actors, uh, Nana Visitors gives birth to Alexander Sadig's kid, so... Uh, I mean, fair, fair, I guess so. They're kissing I think they with... really liked the, uh, like, the kissing they were doing in this their episode. Their kissing was more passionate than anybody else's on there. I was like, oh man, they're gonna just start showing tongue yeah. in this. Yeah, they were like, hey, like, that was really fun. Like, uh, when we get off work, let's go do some more of that. Yeah, well, fair enough. I hope they enjoyed <laughs> enjoyed it. The, they were hardworking actors, and uh, they deserved their fun. Um, that said, uh... <laughs> I usually have very mixed feelings about Loaxana appearances, and this one was no exception. I don't like seeing her sort of <laughs> essentially, like, bullying people into dating. It's, like, it's creepy and coercive. Um, the uh, I don't, like, particularly enjoy watching the discomfort of whoever her latest victim is, whether it's Picard or Odo. <laughs> um, but she had had a great episode with Odo. That's That was what season? Season one. Season one, yeah. So, um, so I was at least open to it. Uh, overall, I was not really into this episode, though, other than like little bits and pieces and fun, you know, a few fun vignettes. I like the Bajoran Gratitude Festival. I like seeing everyone just like celebrating a Bajoran holiday. I like Quark cool trying to uh, uh, commercialize it. It's like that whole idea of like the commercialization of holidays. Yeah. He, he's even doing like some cultural appropriation. He's running around with a Bajoran earring in his ear. Um, yeah, that's true. That part works. Uh, I forgot to also say Peldor Joy to you, Father. Oh, yeah, Peldor Joy. I, I liked the idea of, like, the scroll burning. You write down your problems and burn yeah. them. I, I don't know what that tradition is called, but I know people who do that uh, in real life and in, in, at, at New Year's. You know about this, Father? I've had several friends over the years who've done it where they have, like, kind of a bonfire, and if you've got, like, an X that you're trying to get past... You take all their letters and you burn them and symbolically you're freed from them. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's it kind of it has some similar concepts behind it. And I think that idea has been around for, for a bit, uh, certainly I think would have been around in the 90s. And so I think they were keying off probably at least somewhat things that people really did do. I think that the the trouble in paradise with O'Brien and Keiko felt pretty realistic here. Like when the shuttle arrives from Bajor... And Kira is there, you know, basically like at the airport waiting to see her boyfriend and Burial gets right. out and they're all like passionately like kissing and, and they run off together. And then like when Keiko shows up, it's like a like She's Molly like, I had like, a shitty journey. Yeah. Uh, Molly actually... throws up on O'Brien. Uh, what about like some of the, the pairings in this episode? It was Jake is in love with Kira. Kira and Bashir are both in love with each other. Then Burial is after Dax, but Dax is after Cisco. And then at the end, the uh, the funniest one is kind of disturbing to, to look at. But when Quark is rubbing his ear onto Keiko and she just looks so disgusted in her face, <laughs> like, oh, my God, this this ugly little troll is basically like rubbing his balls on me. <laughs> uh, you know, I feel like I most forgive Jake because he's young and goofy. 
And also because Kira was pretty hot in this episode, I think. Um, well, Keiko looked good in the red dress that O'Brien no, likes. It's like, is, I can um, see know, why he likes that. Something, something I was going to say is like, um, I think this episode was kind of fun in that it let everybody kind of dress up. Um, and that, that, that was just fun in a, a purely visual level. O'Brien's stuff with Keiko was, felt pretty real at times. And I think, didn't they reveal that he wasn't affected when he, like, kind of blew up at her? Yeah, and and I don't like that he got, like, that jealous over, like, the male co-worker. Like, why are yeah, you, like, seemed... airing out all of our problems to him? And I, he went I a little mean, too arguably, far there. he was on edge because she, having been affected by Luoxana's virus pheromones thing, um, had been, like, extra mood swingy and, like, really kind of, you know, like, kind of pushing his buttons when he was really trying to do everything he could to make her return good, and he was really looking forward to seeing her. It got kind of crushed, and then then he snapped back. So I I somewhat get it, psychologically speaking, but but I was like, yeah, yeah, Brian, jeez, goddamn. Yeah, he, he went into, like, apology mode pretty quickly, though, and he was even willing to, like, quit his job and, like, move to Bejour with her. And... Yeah. I, I, I like elements of that, but but sometimes, yeah, some of that stuff I wasn't, I also thought they almost, like, went a little too far with. Um, well, what are the other pairings? So, yeah, Jake, like, had his kind of crush on Kira. Um, uh, oh, Odo, though, does, uh, does, does Odo, what do they do with his, his own feelings for Kira? Do they, do they touch on that? Waxana points it out. Right, it gets concretely realized. She says it, and he, the expression on his face is like, yep, it's true. Um, so that was, that was uh, in some ways the most notable consequence of the episode is that they just formally moved that plot arc forward. What I was thinking while I was watching it was that it was kind of a okay episode of, that was sort of a lark, uh, but not as fun as say, like, uh, the naked time. And it reminded me also of like, you know, that, uh, the Buffy musical episode, there was an episode mm-hmm. that had like a kind of a goofy premise but like through the songs, all, all those songs that reveal your inner feelings and stuff like that, they actually moved forward a bunch of character arcs with it. And that this would have actually been a potentially an opportunity for them to do that. But I think they only kind of barely succeeded at it. You know, like with Odo, it only told us something we already knew. Most of the other ones were things, they were mostly things that would not be followed up on. And so it just feels like a lark um, and not something that had some meaning. I I think some of the stuff here is funny. Like I I can see how it would be like annoying to some people, but I I, I laugh at a good bit of this. And Beryl when he's uh, going after Dax, uh, we just have never seen like that side of him before. And for for that actor to to play things a little bit more comedic, I thought yeah, it was that's it true. was cool to like see that, especially considering what happens uh, <laughs> it, it, the next time we see him on DS Nine, on which we're about yeah. to talk about. Yeah, no, fair enough. I, I I do agree with that. Like that, people who usually play kind of, not necessarily stuffy, but sort of you know staid characters, I guess, uh, to to get to do something a little bit more lighthearted or kind of like larger than life, passionate in this case, is kind of funny. Um, and uh, including you know uh, probably I, I think I actually read in some lo- some show notes somewhere that Terry Farrell had a lot of fun. You know, she does the thing where she's like, oh yeah, I'm super into you, Cisco. And then uh, she, like, later, like, when they medically examine her, uh, she's like, I was joking. And then as soon as they, like, walk out, she's like, I'm really into you. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, and she had a good moment with Morn, where she's like, I can't believe a fun-loving guy like you. All right, what, did, what, what did she say? Like, a fun-loving, oh, handsome guy like you would have all these problems. Right. Uh, that was uh, that was actually one of my favorite Morn moments. Uh, as, as far as, like, a... Overall, I, I guess I'm not the biggest fan of Morn's kind of, like, visual hu- joke that he represents, but that one was one of my favorites. Um, well, uh, let's move on. Uh, we're actually going to skip past uh, episodes 11 and 12, past tense. This is where Cisco and, o- or, I'm sorry, Cisco and Dax and Bashir travel back in time to the 2020s and uh, experience the Bell Riots on Earth. Um, and something that, that we're actually going to dedicate an entire podcast to discussing next week. And we have a special guest lined up. We are actually going to have the return of Will, the Star Trek communist, is going to come join us to talk about a, a Star Trek story that is incredibly relevant to um, 
modern life, especially like here in the, the city of Austin, we actually have a uh, an election today, the day of recording, that I yep. actually think it's going to pass, but there is a proposition to uh, basically outlaw homelessness and arrest anyone, you know, sleeping on the sidewalk and rounding, rounding them all up like they do in these episodes. It uh, is so. weirdly... <laughs> It was weirdly felt weirdly prescient as I was watching it. Um, not that this is not like a t- a thing. I know that when they were making it, I read that there were uh, you know propositions going on in like um, L.A. or whatever uh, that that were relevant to it then. It's not like it's like a new problem, but it just like it's like literally on the day that there's this you know, an election in the city that we're recording in that's highly relevant to it. So, yeah, that was fascinating. Is this, Fathery, are these pr- two two episodes? Because I don't really know the reputation, but I assume these are pretty famous episodes in the Deep Space Nine canon. Yeah, yeah, and they they have seemed to become, like, even more popular in recent years. Uh, just for, like, allowing the characters to also kind of do period piece dress, uh, echoes of City on the Edge of Forever as far as seriousness, uh, Bashir gets to do some very serious stuff in it. Like it's, there's a lot of, there's, a, you know, even aside from the thematics of it, I can understand why, why it's resonated with people and kind of has like a special place. Yeah, and and we'll we'll talk a lot about that next week in Text Truck 142. So keep should an be, eye out. Should be for awesome. That. The, now let's end on this uh, delightful note, Fathery. Yeah. In the, a story uh, the, about. Um, I don't know, euthanasia or something. (laughs) Yeah, uh, the episode Life Support, episode 13, the last that we'll talk about today. After a serious accident, Bashir struggles to save the life of Vedic Baral, while Kai Wen conducts a peace treaty with Cardassia. Jake and Nog reluctantly explore the difference between Federation and Ferengi cultures. That's a uh, nice way of saying, like, they go on a double date where uh, Nog is a misogynistic asshole cockblock, but uh, <laughs> that, that, is the, that is the synopsis. I don't write them, I just read them. Uh, Dave, what do you think about this episode? Um, so I, um, I, I liked the episode. I liked the A plot. I was not wild about the B plot. Uh, I'm just going to quick say of the B plot, two, I think two failings I've seen on Cisco as a parent, neither of which I take too seriously because they are kind of related to comedic styles of the time. One is that he's like, Hey Jake, you got to give, um, Nog a break about trying to treat women like slaves. Uh, it's just how Ferengi are. And you've got to, we've got to learn to live with them. And I'm like, uh, you are letting him off the hook way too easy. (laughs) Uh, Nog needed to be called out. And, uh, you know, this, this was more than just a difference of like, they butter their bread on the other side. This was like a dehumanization thing that Nog was doing. Even though it was played as comedic, I was like, you, you messed up. You done messed up, Cisco. And then in a previous episode, I, I thought uh, when Jake was getting over losing his Dabo girl because she was moving off to the academy, uh, he's like instantly kind of a little toxically positive. And he's like, you got to look up, Jake. He's like, you, there'll be other girls. And I'm like, let the kid have his feelings. Let him feel sad. All right, so... I liked uh, I liked what they did way back when when Guinan schooled Wes and uh, or talked to Wes about it and he's like oh there's never gonna be another one like her and she's like you're right and you know it's just kind of like mm. yes this this person was like a moment in time it's okay to kind of grieve the loss but uh, but it is also true especially if you kind of get away from the sort of the the, the movie style belief of the one uh, that, um, that 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 uh, yeah, you, you, you should – overall, I think Cisco's intent, yes, you'll be able to move on, is good. But uh, I think they wanted it to be a little comedic because he was supposed to be like, whew, my son's not dating the Dabo girl. <laughs> and and I was like, man, let the let the kid be sad. <laughs> anyway, minor stuff. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, Overall, this episode is like so, so serious though. It has well, – they had mentioned a few episodes back – that uh, Vedic Brile was like, hey, Kai Wynn has turned over a new leaf. She's actually, the the job has changed her. And I was like, there's no fucking way. (laughs) She's like the worst person that I've ever seen in Star Trek. Uh, A really savvy, awful demagogue uh, religious leader. And um, uh, interestingly in this, it was kind of hard to pin her down though. 
she was clearly, after he has this accident and they have to use experimental treatments to kind of keep him alive and progressively more and more, you know, uh, difficulties for him. Um, like, it does seem like she's wanting to, do what I guess, like, secure her legacy by, by having this treat, peace treaty with Cardassia. But she didn't seem quite so... I don't know. She didn't seem quite so awful as before. Um, and I, and, and so as, as a result, I don't quite know where they're headed with her other than like, I always assumed the worst of her, but, um, I think she's still pretty bad though in this episode. Like, I mean, she, I guess she is. She is like, her, she's she like, she has very selfish motivations. Like, she, right. I, I always get the impression like she's more concerned with like her legacy that, which yeah, is very no, that, realistic that is for true. politicians. Like a lot of them, you know, like the, their their primary concern is like election and re-election, and then their secondary concern is like their legacy. Right. Yeah. No, I think it's only because like I was like, oh, I'm surprised that she's, you know, didn't crowd Vedic Burial out altogether. That she wants to do a peace treaty with Cardassia at all. But they're all things that are expedient. They're all things that help her, um, and that she that that, that will. Yeah, like leave create a, a greater legacy for her. We so, see how he would have been a much better Kai because he's actually the one who like can do like this negotiation with the Cardassians and. Right, right, yeah, he's he's on it. And losing him, I was I was a little shocked. I had like grown to like him as a character. He wasn't he wasn't like I think super deeply defined, but you know, he was uh, he was what I would hope for in sort of a priest, which is to say he was progressive minded and empathetic. But uh, didn't have some goofy oath of celibacy to make him go nuts. <laughs> That's the thing I I really like about like the Bajorans with like as spiritual and religious as they are, like they have like zero prob like they they you get the impression like they don't have like any type of like sexual restrictions, like they can just like go bang whoever Bajorans they want. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I like I like that notion and and Burrell's does always kind of seem like a dull character to me, but there's three He's times. He's a little flat. There's three times I like him. And this episode is one, like, his death and, like, how he, it wasn't just Kaiwen, like, he also was, like, pushing to get, like, this treaty, even though it was literally killing him. Yeah. I like him here. I like, I like when he's comedic. We talked about, like, a, a couple episodes ago. And then I, I liked him when he falls on his sword uh, and loses the election to save Bajor in season two. Right, right. He is a genuinely honorable guy. Uh, he is the equivalent of the resistance leader in Casablanca, who um, was it? Ingrid Bergman is in is, you know, has married, but she's still secretly in love with Rick. And it's like, yeah, that guy is a great man as a leader, but as a character, we love Rick. He's much more interesting. Uh, his flaws and things make him more interesting. And we just spend all, a lot more time with him. Uh, Burial is almost exactly like that, a, you know, selfless guy who feels a little almost too good to be true, dedicated to the cause. No flaws, really, but um, also just not super interesting. Um, uh, there's as serious as this episode is, there, there is like two moments when I do kind of laugh at it, though, but they're both with the B plot, which I think was in there to kind of, you know, sneak in some levity without this being just too dark and depressing. I, I read that Ron but, Moore wanted to do it, and I think they were like, it's not gonna work. It's, uh, he's like, they're, they're like, the rest is too serious, and he's like, uh, he's like, we gotta do it. And then I think afterwards he was like, ooh, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, the, yeah, it was kind of funny, like, the quote from him from, from from one of those Star Trek magazine interviews or something was, like, very much like, whoops. <laughs> anyway, but, but, but what was the one, though, that you enjoyed? Well, when Odo does the uh, th the trick of, like, pretending to arrest Nog and Jake so that Jake can, like, yep. talk to Nog. And that is kind of a realistic thing. Like, sometimes like, you get mad at your friend, but then, like, you want to make up with them. Um, but he's accusing them of, like, stealing from the Tholian ambassador. Oh, it, yeah, yeah. It, another another very TOS-y reference. I love it. But when Nog says, I don't even know what a Tholian looks like. 
that's kind of like you kind of had to be there to get that joke. But there was a time before, you know, like the TOS remastered episodes came out and Enterprise showed Tholians. There was a time Nobody when all, knew what they looked like. Yeah. All we had was like that original, like that weird painting of like some people thought it looked like a bird. Some people thought it looked like a crystal. But yeah, uh, it, it was it, like the comic books would interpret it all kinds of different ways and stuff. And, and Tholians are just something that was talked about, but never shown because no one was quite sure how to recreate them visually. And so yeah. it's like a when Nog said, I don't even know what a like Tholian a looks like. Yeah, that that, that that cracked me up so much as a kid because I was just like, oh, my God, that is so like I, I love like the like the insidery humor. Like I know like, well, yeah, and you were like some people don't. This but would have been kind of like funny. your early Trek days and like one of those things where you're like, oh, man, that's an inside thing that I. Yeah, I, I get that reference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Father, are you familiar with the sort of serious and very public case in the 1990s about, like, right to die stuff with uh, someone named Terry Schiavo? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was wondering, because I, I, I had to look it up, and it was, like, early 90s, so it would have been within the last few years when the show was being made. Um, it, like, how much that was on their mind. I, I didn't really see any show notes that mentioned it, but I felt like it must have at least somewhat informed their thinking Interesting. about it. It was just, I think, there to inform it, and um, uh, I thought that was some good, some good chops for uh, Bashir. Um, I, I think his best chops of the season were probably in the episodes we'll discuss next week, past tense, part one and two. But, um, but, but then he got some good stuff to do here. Really, sort of highlighted the kind of tough decisions he might have to make sometimes. Well, uh, anything else on this episode? Uh, not a whole lot. I, I'm sad to see Vedic Burial go. He was, um, uh, like, uh, like in continuity, in story, in fiction, I'm like, man, this was one of the guys who probably kind of, like, kept a check on Kai Wynn and also, um, provided her good insight, even if she herself would misuse it or not use it as well as it could be used. But, like, he was a good person to have out there. Losing him is not good, does not speak well for the future of Bajor, I think. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's so sad for Kira, too, but I, I spend a lot of time just feeling sorry for Kira. That, She's, like, uh, the most tragic character ever. She, she, uh, she had another great scene that was essentially a soliloquy uh, at the end where she's talking to him uh, in the final few hours before she knows he's going to pass. And, um, and man, I, I really feel like a Nana visitor can, like, just... She is the best with those scenes, I think, on the show. Uh, I think that um, sometimes uh, I've seen uh, – certainly Avery Brooks kind of uh, can, can, can rise to those occasions. And all of them have the capacity in it, but I just think she's the best at it. So, so I, I love those scenes with her. I'm sorry she has to suffer to entertain me, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there is uh, more Kira suffering, actually. I'm going to – tease the okay. the next episode uh that we're going to talk about heart of stone uh but that's uh not not for today we're out of time for today we'll talk about that after we talk about past tense so in two weeks we will continue we'll have some more ds9 season three talk right on i'm looking forward to it um this is uh, gonna be exciting uh, people say that season four is when uh, when it really heats up and so uh yeah we will, the, we will see. The The leap from season three to season four is probably even greater than the leap from season two to season three. I know of some of the new factors that show up in there. And like in a weird way, like I've kind of like because in, when I watch older Trek, I'm sort of used to part of the paradigm being sort of a comfort food of like the crew. The same crew is almost always there. So it's going to be a little weird for me to see some things shaken up. I might, uh, it might even jostle me at first, and I don't know how well I'll take to it. We'll see. Mm. I'm we'll scared, Pottery. Uh, it's it's <laughs> okay. I'll 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 be there with you. Like, uh, I don't know. I was trying to think of something in the show to compare it to, but well, Peldor Joy. <laughs> Peldor Joy. Okay, yeah. Fair enough. We got to go, but it was real. It was fun. And until next time, as always. Live long and prosper, y'all. Listen to the Text Trek podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or at text-trek.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash text-trek. And follow Fathery on Twitter at txtrek. Please support us by liking our videos and subscribing to our channel on YouTube. Thank you and take care.